Hello and welcome to Unprofessional Engineering. My name is James. You got Luke. Luke, today we're investigating how digital cameras work. Click, click, click. Done. Thank you for joining us. That's Until next time. <laughs> that's what they do. They take pictures. <laughs> so a little bit of stuff's going on here. Conventional cameras depend entirely on a chemical and mechanical process, right? You don't even need electricity to operate them. That's kind of interesting. On the other hand, all digital cameras have built-in computers, and all of them record images electronically. So... Why are you pointing at me? Because I have a, I have a question for you. When okay. you were in grade school... Did you ever do the oatmeal box camera? Uh, I don't think I ever actually did. I've I've heard about it. So it's pretty cool. I can describe it super quick. You take an oat, you take a, an empty box of oatmeal, you paint the inside of it black, you cut a hole in it, you put a piece of aluminum foil over that square hole, and you put a pinhole in the aluminum foil, and then you put a piece of film paper on the inside, and then when you open up or like just pull something from being in front of that pinhole on the aluminum foil. You let it sit for like, you know, 20 minutes, whatever it is, and it takes a picture. It's the light going in, and that chemical process How happens. about that? I took a picture of a G.I. Joe guy fighting a frog whenever I did that. <laughs> that's... I still have the picture somewhere. It was, it was, it was the coolest thing ever. Well, that's odd. Okay, well, thanks, Luke. <laughs> what you basically were describing there was the camera obscura. Did you know that? I did not. It's just a black box with a hole cut into it, or like a pin poke, like you said. It projected a dark image onto a screen. But the weird thing is, to capture that image, this was the original one, you, ba you literally needed someone standing there to sketch the image. So my question to you is, why didn't you just sketch the image of the thing in the first yeah. place, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so next came along the analog film. And I think you probably have a lot more history than I do, but let me just bust through this real quick. Not on like, analog, because we're no. doing digital. Well, I know. I just wanted to throw this out there. All righty. Uh, with this, you could actually capture an image, but it required lots of gross chemicals that we dumped into the mm -hmm. three rivers uh, to complicate <laughs> the treatment process. So depending on your age, you might remember this. I mean, like, I don't. But I assume you do because you're old, right? Uh, well, yeah. Uh, I remember disposable cameras. So, I guess that counts sort so of. So I, I remember uh, film cameras. You would get the little roll of film, and you'd put it in. You'd have to advance it a couple times. <laughs> click, 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 click. Yeah. Um, and then they started to get smaller, yeah, and then the film cameras looked like little dumbbells. They had little you know, yeah, barrels yeah. on either side. Um, but that's as far back as I go. Like, I, I've never... I've never done like a 35 millimeter camera. Mine was always like those point and shoot film cameras. They were always kind of like the ones you'd get at, you know, like a the, disposable camera. Kind, almost. kind of like disposable, Slightly but like, a step but like up hard, from that. yeah, step up from that. Okay. You know, kids these days, they actually like get cameras that they can almost like, uh, like a Polaroid camera where they'd come out. They they use those now because they're like novel and fun. One of our coworkers won't mention his name because I'm going to kind of make fun of him a little bit. Okay. Is into like retro photography and he paid like all this money for like an old school Polaroid. You know that where the film shoots out the bottom, whatever whatever one is. Yeah. And he and it's like he takes pictures with that. It's just like whisper his name to me. Oh no, you know who it is. I know. Well, Total I hipster. You know exactly who it is. Paul? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> you were supposed to keep it quiet. I was kind of picking on for being a hipster. <laughs> My bad. Okay. So then in the, <laughs> the Sorry. 70s, Kodak took the first steps in developing a proper digital camera. Proper. That did not rely on analog data at all. This camera recorded and transmitted data digitally, which is what all cameras do now, basically. And this process is still being used today. That's all the history I had. I kept it short. So I got a whole. Go into more. I do. I Let's do. Hear it, man. So if we go back before, back, 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 back. Very good. Thanks. Uh, so 1975 was the, was was the Kodak thing that you were just mentioning. But even before that, so let's go back to 1950. Um, digital photography actually began in 1957. How do you say it? Fo fo photography. Photography. How how did I say it? I, I'm. Pretty sure my wife says photography. Fur. Like there's an extra R <laughs> you, in you there. You wear it. Yeah. <laughs> um, but there is this uh, cat by the name of Russell Kirsch. Uh, he worked for the United States National Bureau of Standards, and he created this rotating drum that allowed images to be scanned, and they could scan a five centimeter by five centimeter shot. And one of the first things he did was one of his son onto a computer. 
Oh, well, that's nice. 1957. Yeah, 57. Nice. That's crazy. They were driving the Model A in 57, right? Isn't that <laughs> I don't right? Know about that. So 1970. <laughs> so this got even. <laughs> this got even cooler uh, in the 70s. So back in 1970. Uh, Texas Instruments, the cats that make the TI-85, 80, 86, 82, uh, 83. They patented the first electronic camera that didn't require film, but they kind of never did anything with it, and they never, you know, they were all into the calculators. Um, then 1975, Eastman Kodak, which was the original name of Kodak, created oh. the first prototype. Uh, it was created by a guy by the name of Steve Sasson. Sasson. I'm fairly certain that's how you say it. Uh, and he basically... You know, scabbed together a whole bunch of like spare parts uh, from uh, different you know cameras to do this, uh, and they use what's called CCD uh, imaging sensor to do this. And fun fact about that CCD. camera? CCD. That's what I used to go to after church. Oh, yeah. Sunday school. You so went to church. Say. <laughs> Once upon a time. Okay. So fun fact about that original camera: the megapixel they estimate was. Point zero megapixels. <laughs> <laughs> That's should, impressive. You should see this thing. It, 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 it just like gives you one block of color uh, or something. You should, like it, 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 and you should see a picture of this thing. It looked like who's the robot from Futurama? You mentioned Bender. His, yeah, it yeah. looked the, the the camera looked like Bender. It was just this big boxy kind of awkward looking camera. Uh, so the 1980s, uh, it starts to get a little interesting in the 80s, if, if you remember the 80s. Uh, Sony started getting into the game. Uh, Nikon started getting into the game. Megapixels started increasing uh, further and further. Uh, uh, you mean greater than 0 0.0? Greater than 0.0. <laughs> wow. um, a pretty significant step was in 1986 when Nikon created a prototype uh, for an analog electronic SLR. So everybody had those um, uh, SLRs. These are like the traditional film cameras, but they had one of the very first ones. Uh, Fuji released something called the DS-1P in 1988, where it actually stored the images on the device digitally. Uh, and then point-and-shoot technology basically went bananas. Those those little, you know, uh, Fuji FunPix cameras, uh, these cameras were shooting like 1.3, 1.5 megapixels. I have a ton of them. Do you? I do. So, totally related question. I'm as, sure. As per as the usual. Always. Fuji camera and the very expensive water I buy, for sure not when I'm traveling for work, is... Isn't Not it, related? Isn't it Fuji and Fiji water? Oh, is it Fiji? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you were the worst. Okay, then they're definitely Yeah, we're going to have to look that up. So I'm in the 90s, uh, Kodak uh, started to release... It is the, Fiji. It, I thought it was. Right. Uh, Kodak started to release the professional digital camera system. This was really aimed at journalists. This was not um, considered like the typical home you know, point and shoot kind of thing. And it's widely considered uh, the very first digital SLR. So the digital high quality camera that like a photo, photo journalist or photographer, professional photographer uh, would use. Uh, 1994, uh, I'm going to talk about this one a little bit later. Apple had something called the Quick Take uh, 100, which uh, you would hook up to your computer. Uh, 1990, Nikon, 1999, Nikon released the D1. Uh, this is whenever Nikon started to really take over uh, the professional digital market. Uh, Fuji 2000 does not, the fine. Not Fiji. Fiji. Okay. Fuji. Okay. Uh, releases the fine picks. Uh, this is where, like, the non-professional photographers started to get a higher quality. Uh, everyone's heard of the Canon uh, EOS D1. I have not. Okay. Basically, this is, like, one of the, the first, like... Uh, prosumer i think is the word you've wow. heard that word before right? i have not it sounds like something terrible so prosumer is basically it makes me want to hate professional so use the word synergy next please. i will use synergy so pro so it was like a prosumer camera um it, it was to kind of hit that that prosumer market and i'm, I'm going to jump quite a bit here uh, so we're going to go all the way up until, because basically all that happened was cameras just got bigger and better, better and, and bigger better. and better. Or but, smaller and better. Or smaller and better. Then this started to get super sad. In 2004, Kodak stopped making film. Is that sad? It is kind of sad. I feel like it's probably good for the environment. There's a, there's, there's a certain kind of je ne sais quoi 
to is this like, the second time the... you've thrown that out there <laughs> I don't oh, know. i'm impressed so it, it's it, there's something to like the art of taking a good picture and when it's a digital camera you're just like click 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 and uh, one of those will be good so i'm gonna put this out there once upon a time i had this friend we'll call him luke m okay and he was all into pictures and fancy cameras and things like this and then he went to get a family picture and he was using his f- fancy, fancy cameras. And then he gave up and he was like, fine, I'm just going to use my phone. And I'm guessing it was probably on portrait mode. I don't know for sure. Best picture ever. Best picture ever. And he vowed to never bother with cameras anymore because why waste his time? Exactly. And now you're telling me how sad it is and how <sighs> yeah, there's this special yeah, art yeah. to it. And then last piece of, last fun <laughs> fact. So Nikon and Canon also uh, stopped producing film cameras wah, back wah. in 2006. Sorry, Which cameras. is kind of crazy. It is crazy. So that's all the history. Thinking I about how things have changed in the last 20 years is crazy in the camera We're industry. We're way overdue for a break. Oh, my goodness. Let's take a break for a word from our sponsor. Let me guess. No sponsor because, as usual, you are the worst. Actually, smart guy, this episode is sponsored by Zometry. What? What? I know. Mine's blown. If you're looking for on-demand manufacturing with massive network capacity for CNC machining, 3D printing, injection molding or any kind of rapid manufacturing make sure you check out zometry.com and while you're there check out the new complete guide to 3d printing which can be found on the resources tab of their homepage. better yet make sure you use the discount code unpro25 to get 25 dollars off your next purchase james through april 30th that is so much money it is and one more time that's zometry.com x-o-m-e-t-r-y.com Okay, let's talk about some of the components that go into a camera. What do you think? I I think that's a great idea. Is this specifically digital cameras, or are you yeah, well, kind of general? Are you generalizing? I'm saying specifically digital cameras, but some of these parts could be found okay. in other cameras, such as a lens. Uh, it can be found all over the place. So the lens allows us to see the object and focus on it, despite the focal length or other variable settings that go into this. Uh, So it works the same way in an analog camera as it does a digital camera. A lot of the digital stuff, though, is like automated, right? Mm -hmm. Though big fancy cameras you talk about, like you have to do the adjusting yourself and then you get all those cool effects. Or you can just use your iPhone and have it done for you. Another piece for a digital camera would be a memory card. So if you're using a standard digital camera, you're going to need the little digital card you just coming to snuggle me? Or? That you always lose. No, <laughs> I was not snuggling lose. you. No, I, was, I was reading your screen. Oh, okay. I was wondering. Uh, that you use to store your images. You store your images, then you lose the card, and you lose your images. So mm-hmm. that's too bad. Uh, if we think about our phones, though, we don't have those plugged in there. They rely on the built-in memory. So that's helpful, unless you lose your phone, right? But hopefully it's backed up on the cloud, and then you don't have that problem. The interface. This is basically where you connect the cable and hook it up to your camera to the computer. Or Bluetooth. Or Bluetooth. Check out our episode on Bluetooth if you have not already done so. So you don't necessarily need this. If you're transferring like a bajillion photos, though, the cable really helps. It goes a long way. If you're just sending one or two, Bluetooth is the way to go, I suppose. And then the image sensor. And this is like where all the magic happens, right? Uh, This is what's used to convert the image from the lens into the digital image. Can I talk about this really specifically? Uh, Do you have really specifics on this? I have so much specifics about it, you're going to just fall down dead. I'll let you do it then if you want. I mean, it doesn't matter. It's up to you. But anyways, at a high level, image sensors are made up of just tons of light-sensitive pixels that work together to create the digital image. That's all the information I have on it. Okay. No, not really. I'm kidding. So you ready? um, Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So here's what happens when you take a picture. You hit that button. And it's done. It's done. But what's happening in that split second is the aperture aperture Aperture. opens up and it lets in light. That light then hits the sensor at the back of the camera body somewhere. This this is digital camera specific. Mm -hmm. And that sensor itself is made up of millions of light detecting elements called sensors. Millions, so bajillions, so th- bajillions. So this is where like the quality of the picture starts to happen. So the more 
elements and sensors it has that determines some of the megapixel. Uh, each one of those sensors is assigned a red, green, or blue color. And these are arranged in what's called a Bayer filter mosaic. And there's typically two times more green than there is red or blue because this, this mimics the uh, the human eye and the way we're sensitive to green. I did not know that. So I, I didn't, didn't either. Yeah, reading that, it's like the human eye is not equally sensitive to all three colors. It's necessary to include more information on green pixels than the others to replicate what we call, quote, true color. Mm -hmm. No idea that was happening. That's very cool. So as that light hits those sensors... What then happens is those numbers are stored in a huge, long string of data called a raw file. So it's ones it's and zeros ones and, and zeros, zeros and ones, ones and zeros, and it's it's all of those put together. And if you if you ever used a really high end digital camera, you can actually choose to keep raw files. That's what that raw file R A W raw. means. Uh, then what happens is the processing, and then this is where it takes those zeros and ones, and it does what's called interpolation. So if you think <laughs> of where that <laughs> interpolation, I'm using all these big words. Uh, so if you think of where that one sensor is, there's other sensors around it. So what it does is the uh, processing interpolates that particular location puts in the correct amount of RGB color value, so a mix of red, green, and blue, to each individual sensor as it is related to the sensors around it. So it's not just a dot of red or a dot of blue. It's a mix of those three at each location. And then that final result takes all of those gajillion, whatever the number is, and combines all of that color variation, the RGB value. There's only three colors that it uses, RGB, and it turns it into a final image. Wow. You you honestly pretty much nailed that. Nailed it. The one thing I wanted to speak a little bit more of is the light and the photons that hit the pixel. So the more light or light like photons that hit that pixel, the brighter the pixel becomes or the brighter that part of the image becomes mm -hmm. uh, the brighter the spot the higher the digital value is, is that's assigned to it to the digital sensor so you know in that code that's written this value is called the gray value Ooh. so it has a fancy name every time you say photon i think of photon torpedoes from star trek sorry star trek star trek star trek track trek Trek. This, Trek. Is, this is like Stuart all over again. <laughs> Stuart. Sorry, I'm sorry Stuart. I interrupted. Um, <laughs> no, I think that's really all I wanted to, to say. So you talked about how it takes that different information. It kind of smashes it all together to form the picture. The gray value for each picture is used to determine that color. And the brightness is determined by the image sensors. And bam, you have it. bam -o. Um, the other way, there's another way that this can happen as well. So you talked about, um, what was it, the mosaic? Yeah, the Bayer mosaic. The Bayer mosaic filters. So there's another way that this can be done, and that's to separate the colors outside of the sensor using more components. So the sensor's only struck by red, green, or blue light, depending on the components and the filters being used. The image can then be recorded either on three sensors and smash together, or one sensor with a color wheel. And at the end, it's the same result. Interesting. I thought that was very interesting, yeah. Did you think that was very interesting? Eh. No? Eh. Okay, well, here I was thinking that I uh, had a whole bunch of information for you that you didn't know and you didn't even care. Okay, so just with, like, normal films and cameras... Uh, a digital camera has to control the amount of light that reaches the I, sensor. I didn't realize the digital cameras had the same, until I really started to use one, I didn't realize that all the things you're going to talk about still made sense Apply. with dig, applied. I just assumed, oh, it's digital. It's just like it, it freezes. The, Magic. <laughs> I, I don't know what it did. I mean, I don't know how I don't know how anything electronic works anyways. Yeah, well, that's fair. It's not like you're an engineer, right? Nope. <laughs> I'm just a marketer. Uh, the two components it uses to do this are the aperture and the shutter speed. So that's how it controls the amount of light that reaches the center. And those are present in conventional cameras as well. So the aperture is the size of the opening in the camera. So it's automatic in most digital cameras, but some actually allow you to manually adjust 
uh, but to like professional levels or for hobbyists or like a prosumer sort of stuff or for a pro- I'm not even <laughs> gonna say it oh my gosh I think maybe you know this because you're kind of a camera guy uh, you can get like stuff to attached to your phone right like yep. your iphone to make it fancier mm-hmm. for the pictures yeah and and all that really does is it it's it adds basically a lens to the outside it doesn't okay. affect the aperture oh okay. uh, th- this just gives you more distance so oh, okay. so yeah, it's a lens it's, it doesn't affect aperture okay. or the I feel speed like that's kind of awkward but all right another thing is the shutter speed like you just mentioned so the amount of time the light can pass through the aperture so unlike film or like what we'll call a traditional camera the light sensor in a digital camera can be reset electronically so digital cameras have a digital shutter rather than a mechanical one Mm -hmm. which i'm not sure that really makes a whole lot of sense to me so it's not actually like like if you watch a traditional camera you see it go that's not the case in ours it's just done digitally yeah that's kind of interesting i never realized that either i guess i never thought about it but they both again kind of a fun fact i guess they both need slower shutter speeds for low light because they have to let in as much light as possible that's why if you ever do like an old school camera whether it's a digital slr or, or a film camera when you take a low light picture you're like click and it's just like the 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 shutter's open and it's absorbing light absorbing light absorbing light and then closes um basically any picture of my life is a low light Wah, wah. <laughs> not what you're going for no. okay so anyways those two things work together as a team much like luke and james uh to control the amount of light needed for a good image i like it all right so with that let's take a break for this week's luke's rant so here's my rant and it's not really a rant it's just uh, sometimes I f- people like when you don't rant okay so i'm not gonna rant so i i, I feel like the the, the death of the digital camera is is upon us. I, 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 you know, the death of the digital camera. The digital camera, the the independent device that only takes oh. pictures. Oh well, yeah, because why do you want to carry one yeah. of those around on vacation with you? Yeah, That's so I, I I did this hike uh, a few years ago, and I I took this really big fancy digital camera with me, and it was all big and bulky, and it took great pictures, but. I did another hike like a year after that. And was this the one where you went alone into bear territory? No, no, no. no. Well, the okay. first one was alone bear country. The second one, I'm with a couple buddies, and he pulls out his like iPhone, you know, nine or whatever, and it took way better pictures. It fit in his back pocket, and here I got this big clunky camera, and it's just like, I, I feel like if if you're making cameras, so like Canon. You know, hopefully you're doing something else. Hopefully Nikon, you're diversifying hope, your yeah, portfolio. Now, granted, there's always those hipsters. There's always those people oh. that need super professional grade cameras. You know, wedding photographers, that sort of thing. But like the everyday user, I can't imagine people are going to buy cameras anymore. I mean, when was the last time you bought a camera? Have you ever? I'm not certain I've ever purchased a camera. So I, I think no, I, I had one. I had one at one time. I haven't. Work has, per- work has purchased a few for me, but personally, I haven't purchased a, a, a digital cam probably for 10, 12 years. Yeah, mine has been longer than that. So I, I just feel like the death is here of the independent consumer grade, prosumer grade uh, digital camera. It's like your phone. And I'm going to talk about, I got some fun facts about the new iPhone and another phone I never heard of before that's bananas. I, uh, back in the day, actually not that long ago, a few months ago when we moved to the new house uh we were going through garbage that we didn't throw (laughs) out before we left but before like before we were putting it away then in the new house and i think we found like four cameras from my wife and so we took out all of the little cards that she did not lose and then i took it upon myself to scout through those pictures just for some fun yep don't want to see those old spring break pictures no you don't make sure you check out our episode on uh recycling and e-cycling oh yeah that's a great call there luke because I, that that's that's uh digital trash i mean that stuff's difficult to get rid of that's what i call her all the time <laughs> okay so the amount of detail that the camera can capture is called the resolution did you know that luke 
I did. Okay, so it's measured in pixels. The more pixels a camera has, the more detail it can capture, which makes sense to me. And the larger pictures can be without becoming blurry or grainy. More pixels, better. How about that? More better. So like it. Most good uh 1600 by 1200. This will have almost 2 million total pixels, and this is considered a high resolution. Uh, you can print a 4 by 5 inch print taken at this resolution with the same quality that you would get from a photo lab. Okay. So that's pretty strong. It is. Uh, 2240 by 1680, found on 4 megapixel cameras. Uh, that's the current standard there. Uh, this allows for even larger prints with good quality for prints up to 16 by 20 inches. Alrighty. So that's pretty impressive. And then the last one that I have listed is 4064 by 2704. This is a top of the line digital camera with 11.1 megapixels and takes pictures at that resolution. Uh, at that setting, you can create a 13.5 by 9 inch print with absolutely no loss in picture quality. So I have some other numbers. I want to hear your about this. Uh, and, and I think what happens is there's this you, you start losing returns. So like you're saying 11 megapixels. I've seen professional digital cameras that say they're 20 there megapixels. There are more, yes. But there's no difference. Like right. like once you get above that, it, it, you're really it, it's it's a marketing ploy. Yeah. You know, it's it's like it, you're not going to notice the difference between an 11 I megapixel. Hate marketers. I do too. <laughs> like an 11 megapixel and a 20 megapixel, you're probably not going to notice the difference unless you're printing it to be like the size of football field you're just not going to notice the difference sure uh but fun fact i want to hear a fun fact and we're going to switch over to cameras or phone cameras there's a camera out there called what else matters exactly right? called the cc9 pro it's from a company called zonai x i a o m zomi. zomi i've never heard of it before. i don't know that's what i'm going I, with. i've never heard of it before they have a camera, a phone that has a camera on it that is 108 megapixels. Wow. That's bananas. And I don't use the term bananas very often. Actually, I use it a lot. But how does it do that? I, you do? I have no idea how they do it. See, that's interesting because I have, from my fun facts, that the EOS 5DS and the 5DSR cameras offer the highest resolution capture in history. Oh, I guess it's of the EOS history, and that's a full frame 50.6 megapixel. Yeah. That's, so yours is double that. It's crazy. And How then, much does that cost you? I think? don't know, about a billion dollars. Oh, probably. But yeah, but it's a phone and a camera. So in comparison, the iPhone 11, it only does 12 megapixels front and rear in 4K video. So this thing is literally a magnitude, like 10 times better front and back side sides. yeah they both do because you know normally the front camera and back camera are different they are different normally but, but in the iphone 11 pro max it's the same 11 megapixels front and back how much does that phone cost that phone is 1900 no 1099 dollars there you go yeah i mean that's affordable versus 1900 another fun fact speaking of the apple iphone 11 Pro Max at a cool grand. Cool. Back in 1994, you could get the Apple Quick Take 100 that I talked about earlier. It also cost $1,000, and it would save eight images at 640 by 480 resolution on the internal memory. So the fact that <laughs> Apple has a camera that is literally you know, 25 plus years old for the same price that their iPhone 11 is, is just... It's kind of a crazy comparison. So I have a question for you. Shoot. I saw that the the 11 Pro and the 11 Pro Max have, quote, triple camera systems that add a real, rear telephoto lens. Like, what's that? Do you know what? Why Why do I need triple camera system? I think it, it, what it does is it combines, it, it actually takes photos from each one and combines them and gives you higher resolution. Oh, well, that's kind of neat. Okay, a couple fun facts for you, Luke. Shoot. HP, our friends at Hewlett Packard, estimates that the quality of a 35 millimeter film is 20 million pixels. That's pretty good. Yeah. Uh, another fun fact, the first consumer oriented, oh, you mentioned this one already. The first consumer-oriented digital cameras were sold by Kodak and Apple in 1994. Mm -hmm. What did you call them? Uh, it's called the Quick Take. Kodak oh, no, actually made the, it for Apple. The, the Pro, 
prosumer. There you go. I wasn't going to say it. <laughs> okay, and my favorite fun fact and the last one that I'm going to throw out there. In 1998, Sony inadvertently sold more than 700,000 camcorders with a limited ability to see through clothing. What? Right? That's the best. It's like a vision camera. I don't know, but I love it. Um, okay, anything else from you? Because I just want to wrap things up with some shout-outs. I got nothing. All right, a couple shout-outs here. We had Trent W. right in. Trent W. is a freshman. I believe he said incoming freshman, so maybe that means next year. Oh. Or maybe currently one. But at Michigan State University. Go Mud Hens. Spartans. Thank you. Spartans? Yeah. Big thought... Ten team. Okay. Loves the heck out of us. Says we've taught him a lot. I think that's what he said. Well, it we, was very nice of you, Trent. We teach everybody a lot, I feel. Yeah. Just Stickers saying. are in the mail, Trent. Uh, Sandy Yu, this is a really good one. From Central Pennsylvania, only the best of civilization. Loves Sheets, because who doesn't love Sheets? And if you don't sheets? know what Sheets is, look it up. And if you and if you know what Wawa's is, Sheets is way better than Wawa's. Heck yeah, Sheets for the win. Uh, suggest that we stop by the National Watch and Clock Museum nearby Central PA. I think mm-hmm. it's outside of Harrisburg we'll somewhere. Have to do that. that would be interesting. Yeah, it would be kind of interesting. If you have a shout-out, or want a shout-out, if you have some places we should go visit maybe we could take an unprofessional engineering field trip (laughs) that would be great it would be um or uh topics for us to cover want some stickers whatever the case may be email email us at unprofessional engineering at gmail.com make sure you subscribe Uh, like share review only five stars please jump on the (laughs) Jump on the iTunes or wherever you listen. Leave us one of those reviews. Make sure you subscribe so you can get our sweet voices beamed to your ears every week. Right in the ear holes. Awesome. Hopefully you all enjoyed this episode on how digital cameras work. And until next time. See ya.